<laughs> this is the lecture for European history for Thursday, the 14th of April, 2022. What is lost cannot just be calculated in terms of numbers. A few, well, it's close now to almost 15 years ago, I had an opportunity to spend a week with Holocaust survivors and their families. And one of the things that I never had considered before was that it wasn't just those who died, it was also those who were never born, the children of the dead, the people that the dead would never get a chance to influence, the grandchildren who would never be. And all of this hopefully illustrates that when you kill a single person, you're not only killing a body, you're not only killing every hope and dream that they had for the future, you're not only killing every hope and dream that other people had for and with them for the future, but you're also destroying any potential influence that they might have had. Could cancer have been cured by any of their descendants? Could the common cold? Could an answer to racism, sexism, fanaticism, zealotry? What art hasn't been made? What music not written or played? All because of those many millions of dead. Well, the same can be said for the lost generation. One of the legends of the peace after World <coughs> War I is the lost generation. Now, when one first hears that, one thinks of the war dead. And certainly, that's true. The men who were maimed and killed, whose lives as they knew them were ended in one way or another, are gone. And they're gone from the breeding pool. And they're gone from the influence that they have as parents and friends and artists and politicians and all the rest. But in addition to that, there's the generation that survived. That learned to live with death close. Not heroic death. Not cowardice and, and heroism and, and one gets punished and the other gets reward. Not death that is in any way apparently just. But the kind of death that happens in the trenches, random death. An artillery shell hits. Somebody lives, somebody dies. A dugout is collapsed. People live, people die. You happen to expose yourself foolishly and a sniper ventilates your skull. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, and so do the shells. This brutalizes a person. When I, when we were to early in the war on terror, I believed that we should torture prisoners to get information. Colonel Allen West, who became a congressman for a while and is somewhat of a media celebrity, became famous because he, as an army officer in Iraq, Colonel West had a prisoner who had information about an attack that was going to happen against Americans, quote, very soon. The guy was being defiant. Colonel West took out his sidearm, fired it next to the man's ear, pointed it at his head, and the man talked. Americans were saved, a terrorist attack was thwarted, and Colonel West was punished for violating the Universal Code of Military Justice. Waterboarding does not fit the definition of torture in the sense that it is not, it's not a physical attack, it's purely psychological. It uses a human's instincts. And while I still think that there are times when torture is necessary in wartime, to save lives. I don't think that our troops should do it. I think that our allies or our intelligence services should. For this reason. And this is a change of mind I had from back then. I was more angry back then. 
When you torture someone, it takes some of your soul. You have to do things that you can't recover from. You can't unlearn. You can't unremember. You will have to take another human being and harm them willfully, purposefully, with the intent of breaking their spirit, of breaking their mind. Now, there are people in this world who are perfectly capable of doing that by day and going home and playing with their puppies, kittens, and children at night and being good parents. Some of them are, are famous in the Holocaust. Most people can't do that and come away un, untainted. So I don't believe that the average American serviceman should be involved in anything dark like that. I think that one of the glories of the American Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard is that we have people who choose to serve when they don't have to. They choose to live uncomfortable, dangerous lives for the greater good. That's idealism. It's not just to pay for college. It's to do something worthwhile with your life. And if you've ever met somebody who's uh, 20 or 21 or 22 who, who's in the military and compare them to the average person that you know who's in college, you will see the difference. One is an adult. The other is still a child. Usually, there are always exceptions. To take a person like that and force them to do harm is un... It's not good. You're blighting lives. So what the lost generation also means are those who survived, but were damaged by the war, were damaged by the death, by the casualness of it all. Dubber's, w, Dubber, Dubber, w. Somerset Maugham, a British author, wrote a book about Americans in the war called The Razor's Edge. It's been made into two movies, one in the 1940s and one in the 1980s. Today we're going to see extended clips from the one in the 1980s to give you a sense, because to me this is the quintessential novel of the lost generation. We'll get to, back to totalitarianism tomorrow. I don't see any questions, so let's get going.